1942 started shipping goods to England <coughs> because they knew the, the, that to win the war, they were going to have to defeat Germany on, on, on European soil. So they started building up in England little by little by little a long time to two years before the actual D-Day occurred. And I don't know the details of that or what it was, but uh, this was true of the B-47s and, and such. But let us get started. Uh, this, by the way, may be the earliest picture of LST-325. It's dated October 1942. It's a Philadelphia Navy Yard. It looks like it's a rainy day. You see the people? And these people, I'm sure, have been right here where they have twisted that ship. Just as they did at the Evansville shipyard, they took the bottle of champagne and wiped it. So I'm sure that's what happened right here. The woman christened that ship with the bottle and these people are leaving, it's been raining. But looky here, what does that say? Now this is what you're going to see as we go through here, by the way, particularly on some of the 101st uh, insignias, they've been blacked out for censorship because these were wartime photos and they didn't want the enemy to know who they were, who these pictures were. So see where they just took white out and white it out on the photo and that may say 325. Th and see here's a christening. So I'm not sure what that is, but it, it appears like that's 325 when it was christened or launched. And I'm not just sure which or what. But I thought I'd show that to you. Did you know the 101st Airborne was in and lived in Evansville for three months? The the uh, and I notice I've got this in red. The 502nd PIR Parachute Infantry Regiment was the key group of 101st Airborne. And by the way, this was my opening because I I want to track the Airborne these Evansville boys through Normandy and on into Germany, and I'll end with them. So I want you to see. These guys walked the Evansville streets. Believe it. So here we are. I live, by the way, here's the airport. Uh, here's the Republic Aviation plant being built. I lived right here. I was nine years old when the war ended. Dad worked at Republic and would walk to work. I'll show you pictures of, this was the best known group right out in here on the airport. Uh, the final second parachute infantry, PIR as I go through here was camped in these three places. Here's Sunset Memorial Gardens right now. There was a, they found a tent pegs, trenching and such as that in later years. So they, they thought they had uh, somebody camping on the grounds out on the, on the hill there where Sunset Gardens is. When I grew up, I had heard of a group of, this was the Evansville Vandor County Poor Farm. And I heard that here was St. Peter's, uh, Petersburg Road the old Highway 57 location, the the uh, the command post was at McCutcheonville in the park. And this was Swartz Gro Grocery. Do any of you remember Swartz Grocery? That was the PX. The PX, if you don't know, was Post Exchange. The paratroopers could go out here and, and, and uh, Swartz Grocery, and they could buy Lucky Strikes, they could buy Baby Bruce, they could buy milk, they could buy chocolate milk. The local people like to go in and look at it. They couldn't buy it. <laughs> they would go in and just look at the stuff because they had seen a Baby Ruth candy bar for a couple of years and not Lucky Strikes. You know, they went to war with the chocolate milk and things like that. These boys see the soldiers. There's two up right here, 101st Airborne. Now that's a long walk up in here from here or here or here, but that's what they were all about. Well, they were all about walking and running and jogging and they would take these boys out at night and with a canteen and a compass and a map and they'd have to find their way back to the bay. I don't know how far they'd take them, but they would take them out in jeeps and dump them. Paratroopers were all about finding your way by the map and the compass. Okay? So that's what they were doing. Anyhow, I'll show you the bunch at Sturgis Army Airfield in just a moment. There was a different bunch there, and they were also in Evansville, and you'll be impressed when I show you about them. Uh, this was the Thunderbolt, the dog that, that the boys at the airport adopted, and they took this dog to them, with them to England. Uh, this was a 502nd PIR. See the dog in charge? <laughs> it 
here was their band. The, they played for the Qantas Club. This is out of the Emsel Press. Local men playing paratrooper band at Qantas meeting. And this is 502 PIR, which was just in Evansville all over for three months. Now, down at Sturgis Army Airfield was another bunch, which at that time was not yet a part of the 101st. And it was a 506 PIR. Who were they? You know them better. Did you see Band of Brothers? Have you read the book Band of Brothers? This is who they are. And these guys were at Sturgis for three months, and they came to Evansville on the weekends. Uh, all of the vet, all of the trainees would come to Evans, the largest town. And they would come in on Friday nights. So I'm not sure these boys were like the Cap, Cap Breckenridge and George Army Airfield. Uh, these paratroopers may have been more in business. They were not training. They, they were prepared to fight, uh, unlike the boys at Camp Breckenridge and such. So anyhow, I'll, I'm going to end the show pretty much with these guys. I'll show you how they work. Uh, but they were in Evansville. They slept here. They, they drank beer here. They bought cigarettes and stuff here. Right here in our town. I wanted to follow them through this as best I could. Uh, they also had gliders at Sturgis Army Air. You know where Sturgis Airport is? That was a big military base. They were having a thousand flights a day during the war. A thousand flights a day out of Sturgis. <coughs> around the clock, around the clock. And they, this was the, the uh, 506 glider group. I don't know that Evansville had any gliders at the airport out there. But Sturgis did. There's a plaque on the wall down in the, top, in the airport that tells about that. And in September 1943 was when the 101st Airborne left. I think they shipped out of North Carolina and went, went to Europe. I went to England. These men, well, this was Shapes, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force Command. And you have Bradley, here's Eisenhower, Tedlers. Uh, what these men did, and of course there are thousands of helpers and underlings, how on earth can you keep something as critically important as an invasion of Europe, not only the, the date, but the time and the place. They kept it completely secret. That sounds impossible. As a matter of fact, as you'll see as we go through, Germany didn't believe it. When, when Hitler heard the news that they had invaded Normandy, he did not believe it because he knew they were going to land somewhere else. Can you believe such a thing actually went on? Subterfuge, deceit, uh, that's what you want to do in war. So these men, and the thousands of, of men that were working for them kept all of this secret and convinced Germany it was not going to be where you think it is, it's somewhere else. So they were, they were in disbelief when, when our boys landed in Normandy. The, the, the European, the, the build-up in South England was, I guess, unbelievable. Uh, when they built up, they had to have all of these, the, the K-rations, and the rifles and the bullets and the P-47s were all building up for, for Normandy, for D-Day. So here was some of the P-47s, I don't know if they're Evansville. You know, there's two, two Republic Aviation plants, Farmingdale, New York, which is out to the other side of New York City, and Evansville. So I don't know where these came from. There was a constant flow. Um, so this, these may be some Evansville, maybe all Farmingdale, I don't know, but they're all cocoon wrap and storage. Look at the, this is a row of belly tank boxes, crates. Look, 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 look at that. What's a belly tank? Here's one on a little demon when she, that's Sunset Memorial Garden in the background. This is Evansville Airport. That's a belly tank right there. They had two sizes, a small and large. And I don't know if these boxes had large or two smalls, what have you. But uh, when the airplanes would fly, they'd, they'd fill this up and they'd give them an extra 100, 200 miles. And they would drop them when they, when they went into combat, the scrape, or the fight, dog fight. They would drop them, so you needed essentially one, one belly tank per flight. So you can see all of the boxes they had, but that's what these were. Don't you love this picture? <laughs> you know, this, this is the way Southern England looked. Uh, the French maid leads their milk cows home. And, you know, the bombs are just thrown out there. And she, feels, she appears very comfortable. The cows are kind of sniffing, and what is this? So that was the way England looked. As we go through, you'll see some more. Uh, story yard, story yard, story yard. God knows what's in here. 
But you know, this was all stuff that they were accruing for the, for the invasion and to be loaded on ships and dropped out of airplanes and all such. Shell bunkers are along an English road. I, I don't know, they're, they're something like, would you care to guess? They might, looks like a five inch or something like that, what, 120 millimeter? Maybe 155s, I don't know. But you can just see them on that beautiful English road and they're there for the duration. <laughs> this is this is the book right here, and the title is Overpaid, Oversex, Over Here. Have you ever heard that phrase? This was the, what the English mom, not the women so much, but the English men used to say. The the American private was paid what forty bucks a month, forty two bucks a month, I think. The Englishman was only getting two or three dollars per month equivalent. So you can imagine where the Englishman said, you know, <clears throat> overpaid, oversexed, and over here. Uh, it's a good book, but down in the bottom of this picture right here is this picture. And I, just, I happen to have this, and I'm like, i got to show this to you. I have a friend who hates bagpipes. <laughs> and he said the only good sound a bagpipe can make is when it hits the bottom of a junk barrel. <laughs> so, anyhow, I count, pardon me, I count ten bagpipe players, uh, two drum, three drummers, uh, a leader maybe, and another leader. But see the American soldiers coming off the ship, and they're getting serenaded by the bagpipe band. <laughs> Pretty cool. And that's what's on. The, that's what's at the bottom uh, of this book right here. Thatched huts in England. Airborne soldiers taking their you know jog, uh, run, race, whatever to keep up. And you see the thatched roofs. I have two, another picture of them, but I like the the what would you embroidery work? I don't know what that is, but that looks pretty good, huh? Thousands. Of, there are thousands of American troops, and I don't know if this is some kind of exercise they have out on the English countryside. How many of you have seen the movie Band of Brothers? You see how many series? You know, you remember when they were working in the English countryside? And uh, they cut the cat, cut the fence, and the cattle got out to embarrass Captain. What was his name? Soul. Th that's right. So anyhow, I kind of thought of this with with no trees. I don't know where that is in England, but uh, this was they trained just like the 101st, like in the Band of Brothers movie. African American troops. They're they're taking up some ales. Some of them have a pint, and some of them have a glass. And uh, they're they're chatting with the men just on the English English countryside. They had, by the way, notice they got full kit, full gear. Bing Crosby singing in London. Notice the name of it: Stage Door Canteen. Uh, you've heard that before. Stage Door Canteen. The movie. Was that was it a movie? Is that why I know it? Yeah. It was the name of a movie. Was it about Was it about England in World War II? Hollywood entertainers. Okay, Hollywood entertainers. So that's where being notice the crowd. Here is standing room only, really. So that's being he looks pretty young there. This is this is a look at flying down the beach, by the way, see the Germans running to the guys went. This is you know, they didn't know if they could have fired on a wall, but as a cannon play. What's interesting here is that the Germans were very clever. And what they did with the beach to, to guard it and protect it with a small number of men, cannons. Uh, the, you know, you don't see many cannons. They would have a cannon here and another one maybe several miles down where they could target to, to the, to the uh, boats as they were came ashore and the troops. Uh, so the Germans were very clever. They had to go out some of these things and reset them for high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide. Uh, because they were designed to, like maybe here, they're putting a mine on top of that one. They devised ways that a small group of German soldiers could go out twice a day and do this. Uh, it was it was a, a big job for them, and it was pretty good. What the Germans did was was very very well done. This is this is titled "It's Been Good Knowing You." A GI from Maine says goodbye to his East Anglian Anglian mother. So he's telling her goodbye. He's, he's running down his orders to report with his gear, and he's going to go.
six that were trained as Sturgis, that was a totally different arrangement. You had you had one glider and one airplane. And it's so complicated, I thought about showing you a picture and I couldn't figure it out myself. You know, it's one big airplane and a whole lot of cable and a glider. All just kind of intermixed in together. So I thought you'd like to see this one. This this amazed me and it's on your on your handout. See the paint stripes. By the way, these are under first stripes. See they're they're their patches are covered up, inked over, so as so that the enemy couldn't see who these boys were. That was military secret. But see the way they've done this, and some of the pictures, if you look, actually they use mops. But they got to command, they got to command for the boys to load the planes and the boys to load the ships and to start painting the airplanes at 4:30 in the morning. Why? Because they didn't want some somebody with binoculars to see these stripes and go back and start painting the German airplanes. You know, this was they had the stripes around the tail and around both wings. Every every Allied airplane had that, and they didn't start painting on until 4:30 in the morning, which which was pretty close to getting on over to to Norman flying to Norman time. So I thought you'd like to know about that. Uh, there's one, if I don't forget to show you, it looks like the top part was tape or something as I go through. I may forget it. Here's Eisenhower. And you know who he's talking to? This is the boys that were in McCutcheonville. The 502nd, I'm sorry, PIR. This is Eisenhower. There's two or three pictures of this. These were all Evansville boys. And I just found it out while I was doing this. Uh, he went down to the, to the airport where they, were, where they were going to board their planes. You know, he's just chatting with the guys, seeing they got their hundred first. But these were all boys that walked these streets of Evansville in that May, June, and July of 1940. Was it 42? boats going ashore. Uh, this was this was the actual Normandy. There's one, two, three, four, five of them going ashore. Here's something you didn't know. You know, the LST 325 has two. Korean War vintage uh, Higgins bolts, which are all metal. These are all essentially all wood. And by the way, let me share it with you right now. During World War II, the Shanville Shipyard built three all metal LSTs. I had no idea why. There's a, there's only one picture 
And they were using them in the flood in 1943. But Evansville Shipyard built three all metal Higgins bolts. And that's all I can tell you. That's all I know. Uh, they were used in the flood, and what happened to them afterwards, I don't know if it was a good experiment or a bad experiment, but these are, these are essentially all wood, made largely in New York. There were several places that did it, uh, California and, and around the states, but the bulk of them came from New Orleans. And here they are going ashore, four Navy crewmen on each one of those. And their apparel, how many trips did this boat make in and out of Normandy that day? You know, those Navy those Navy guys got pretty tired of that, but and probably a lot of them lost their lives as as our as our infantry did going ashore. And here's a this is a well known picture. This was taken from a Higgins boat. We all of this is wood that you see here. Uh, maybe some metal treads and things like that. For five days, for five days, this went on from June the sixth to June the tenth. Then Omaha. And uh, the other beaches, it was called the landing process. It was a five day. They got eight divisions in the first day, 156,000 men. And then they had just kept on bringing stuff in. This is the way it was out there off of, off of Normandy for several days until they got their landing process finished and completed. And nurses, I'll show you pictures. Nurses began to come ashore at that time. Here's LST 325, she was there on the, on the 7th, and she brought uh, 59 vehicles, 480 enlisted men, 31 offers of a 30th chemical decontamination company to Normandy. That's what LST 325's first trip was. And see, each one had a garage, but you can see three here, LST 325 had one as well. I left it out because I couldn't show you every picture I wanted to, so. But I have a, a convoy picture, and every, every ship has, has its own barrage balloon. There's like 40 of them in the convoy. Uh, that was to keep, the German, to keep the German airplanes from coming down and attacking. Uh, how well that worked, I don't know. By the way, there was only two German airplanes were seen on, over Normandy on D-Day. Only two. We had pretty much wiped them out. Think about this. We couldn't, we couldn't go in and strike and just, just shoot up Normandy like we wanted to because that would have given away the location. So they would have to go to other beaches and bomb it, go to other beaches and strafe it while they were doing Normandy. Normandy was treated just like all the other beaches and ports uh, to keep Germany from figuring out where we were going to land. And that was quite a chore, but you know, they did it. It worked. It was great. Nurses come ashore on June the 7th. Uh, some of many of the lieutenant right here and the others I'm not sure. And by the way, this, this was a bad day for Adolf Hitler. On, also in June 1944, the, the Russians began their counterattack on, on Germany. So all of a sudden Germany had, had the Allies coming in from Normandy and had the, the Russian Allies coming in from Russia. And those were the largest events of all time. The, the German invasion of Russia was like four million men. And most of them died. Most of them died in Russia over the next couple of years. The Russian used two and a half million, 2.3 million soldiers to counterattack Germany, and they won. They had their way. Stalin wanted. Churchill and, Eisenhower, Churchill and Roosevelt to attack the Germans a year or so before they finally agreed they could do it. That they, remember the buildup was 1942, but we didn't have the we didn't have the supplies, the troops. We had trained enough men and nurses to go in until we did in June. Initially, the date was set for May. 1944. That's what they told Stalin that we would invade France in, in May of 1944. Well, they were pretty close. They were off by a month, two weeks, what have you. So you see how all this kind of worked out. Stalin was pushing every time they had their conferences. I gotta have some help. I gotta have some help. So by golly, if in the same month Germany was counterattacking two different sides. And we also had an invasion of southern France during just a little bit after, and also in June of 
That was August of 44. British soldiers get their milk. See their milk in their cow? Got your bucks. This is a flail for mines. And that's a tank. And this thing would just, this thing would just flail. And any mine that was in front of the tank would explode. And you have, you have a safe path to tread. So here the British soldiers get their milk. And the American soldiers get their wine. I thought you'd like the contrast in these two. So uh, the American soldiers, and I'm sure the, the English soldiers, and the French soldiers were well loved by the countryside. Not all Frenchmen were happy to see this. A lot of the Frenchmen had adopted to the Germans and the Germans were leaving them alone. And all of a sudden comes in all these guns and cannons and tanks and all of that. And the Frenchmen were pretty upset because they had, they had fallen into a life that they were comfortable with. And then all of a sudden, you know, all of that changed. So not every Frenchman was happy to be liberated. If Germany had just evaporated and gone, that might have been better. But, you know, all of this gunfire. And those towns, these French men and women and children were slaughtered because they were in the way of the bombs and the rockets and the rifle bullets. And, and a lot of them were killed. And it was just progress. It was just the way it lived. This is the 101st Airborne again. I keep showing them to you. Uh, this is seeing the girls in the white. Soldiers are greeted by friendly French men and women. Uh, see, he's got his rifle. Notice that maybe there's another one back here. So, you know, the, the, the French men have been fighting on their own. These were gorillas. I love the picture of the nurse. This is a nurse, and she's doing nothing but carrying these, these loaded cans of fuel, gasoline. I, I think those are, those are the, anybody know, the, 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 the jerry cans with the large hole were for water, the jerry cans with the small holes were fuel, all and such as that. So I think that's what she's carrying. These are, these are gasoline cans or, or tanks or jeeps or trucks or P-47s or P-51s with handbook. See the stripe? There's, there's the remainders look like that one just kind of flew out like it was wallpaper or something. <laughs> so the stripes were mopped, painted with brushes. But remember, they started out in the middle. I, you know, that, that astonishes me. 4.30 in the morning, how do you see the paint? But they did. You know, they, 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 they made do with what they had to. Here they are loading up a P-40, uh, rearm in a P-47. See the stripes, by the way, still on the wings. Here's a P-47. You clearly see it's a P-47, and here's what they're doing. There's their, there's their ammo cans, and they're loading her back up, and they're going to take that guy, and she's going to strafe, strafe, and strafe, and strafe. The P-47, when it was first designed, first built, was strictly for air-to-air -air combat. That was it. That's all a P-47 was designed to do. And I don't show his picture in here, but there was there was a right before or after this, he said, put me a bomb on my P-47. And they did it. They, they figured out a way to strap a 500-pound bomb to the bottom. You remember where they saw the belly tanks? That's where they put his 500-pound bomb and gave him a thing to pull. Loved it. It worked. But that brave man, this airplane wasn't designed to do that. Nobody, see, they weren't, they didn't have the, that, they didn't have the aeronautical, um, aeronautical skills that our designers do today because they just didn't know that the P-47 could carry it on. And it did, and it was not long after that before they started putting a thousand pound bomb on each way, all because of the guy that said, I want a bomb on the airplane. And then it began to put rockets on it. The P-47 became so lethal. Strafe with, with the eight machine guns, it could fire the rockets, it could drop bombs, it could go up and take out the German fighters. And a B-47 is a heck of an And half of them were built here, the other half had farming ground numbers, the other half had farming days. <coughs> On July the 25th through the 31st was a Normandy breakout. They had struggled for about seven weeks to break out of Normandy. You know, they kept going, but they couldn't break loose. And in this curve right here, they did. And I chose this young German soldier with his surrender flag, and this guy with his rifle, you know, going to the back, buddy. And this guy may have gone to Camp Breckenridge, or Camp Campbell, or Fort Knox, 
So, you know, they brought a lot of German soldiers, POWs, over here to Breckenridge and Campbell. And I guess every, every military base probably was taking German or Italian or in the West, Japanese soldiers, perhaps. Deliberate, by the way, notice the dates. Uh, July the 20th, D-Day, June, June the 6th. Then they broke out seven weeks later and they liberated Paris a month later. See how that how they kind of looked? They went forward. I chose this when there were several pictures. I could have showed you the gold or a tank set, American tank, but I, I thought this has a, the eye the, the uh, what's that called? Arsenal trim, yeah. And the American soldiers, I like that. And these were German POWs dressing in an American cemetery. I looked at trees. No leaves, chip uh, coats, so it's probably in the fall of 1944. And America asked for some land from France, and they got it. You know, there's several remarkable cemeteries at the Norman. I've never been there, I've never seen them. I know someone in here has, but they're special places. Bastogne. I remember the Battle of the Bulge? And 101st Airborne was they, they were in, they were in there fall clothing, summer fall clothing, and they were assigned to go to Bastogne, Bastogne. And they arrived on December the 19th. Some of them you'll see, I'll show you another picture to show you how badly. This was one error that the United States government made, which was really bad. Hitler did the same thing with his, when Hitler invaded Russia, he thought, and they didn't go in until July, of 1941, whatever it was, they went in and summer beer. They thought they would have Russia conquered and at the, on their on their heels from by winter time. Well, they didn't, and the Russian winter killed German people, killed those German soldiers by the hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of them. But well, we didn't do much better. We thought. Our political leaders, and I'm not, this is no critical, I'm not being critical here, but we really thought that we would have France and Germany conquered by Christmas of 1944. We believed that with all of our heart. Just like Hitler believed that of the, the German invasion of Russia. Neither one did it. So our boys were badly equipped for winter. It was a hit and miss thing, whether you had long coats, whether you did not. Follow me for the next pictures. Here they arrived to Bastogne. This is a famous photograph. This is a church service on Christmas Eve, and right after this picture was taken, the log started falling. If, if you've seen Band of Brothers, you remember when, when the nurse is killed in Bastogne? The, she, you remember that? Well, here, that was what this was all about. You know, that was fictionalized, but these boys, were, you can tell, they just, you know, these guys are giving a look at that. They're just giving out. Cold, bad food, little food, little water, 24-hour uh, day watch. So these were boys, you see the cross and the candles and such. Right after this picture was taken, the bomb started falling. And I don't know the rest of that story, but that was this one. And here they are leaving, leaving. So look at your coat. These are, these are not winter clothes. This is not winter clothing that these boys were wearing to fight the Germans in that storm. And these are all 101st Airborne troops. You can't see any patches, but all of these are 101st Airborne troops. Because that's all that was there, was 101st Airborne. The boys out of Evansville and the boys out of Sturgis. In 1945, later on, Free France recovery. You can see sandbags. You can see she still shot up a lot of damage. But look at her flags, you know. They're winning. They, they're on their way to recovery. And the American soldiers hanging around. And if you saw Band of Brothers, you saw this, you saw a scene of this picture right here. Here come the American troops, two lanes on the Autobahn, going into Germany, going north, if you would. And here go the German soldiers, about the hundreds of thousands, going to the south. We didn't want German soldiers, well, for, we were still at war with Germany. We didn't want German soldiers going anywhere but away from the back. And there was another problem. And I know this from Fort Campbell. Fort Campbell had German POWs until 1947, when they could finally go back and carry their own load. Because there was no food, there was no housing, there was no 
come, there was no water for, the, for all of these soldiers to go into Germany after they had surrendered. So the boys that kept them at Fort Campbell, I do not know about Camp Breckenridge. I have an idea they kept them over there until 47 or 48. Somewhere there's records of that, but I, I never found those. So these guys are going south, and the Americans are going north, and that is the way it was on that day. And there's a scene in, in Band of Brothers, the HBO show, where you could see them, where, where you see them doing this. You know, how many, how many men are there? No, all of them are disarmed. They probably have little food, probably get a little water every now and then. It's a, this was a hard time to be a POW. But yeah, they're, they're safe. They're going to survive. Unlike those boys in Russia, they caught you over there, you probably felt pretty bad about your, your survival chances. I'm down close to the end. Now here's, here's the Band of Brothers. The, the boys were at Sturgis with the 506 Band of Brothers. And this is an actual picture. You remember, you remember uh, Dick Winters? This is Dick Winters. And here's Nixon. Uh, here's Welsh over here. Three names I remember from that show. I watch it every time it comes around. I probably watched it five, six times. And I'll watch it again. Uh, but, but here it was. This is, this is the movie. This is the actual movie scene of this same setting with the mountains in the background and the guys got their wine bottles. Do you remember that scene? I, I wanted to put this in my book, which, which will talk about the, the 101st Aragorn, but that's copyrighted. I'm afraid, I'm afraid HBO could not get me if I use that picture in a book. I'm using this, this, this will be in my next book sometime later this year. Uh, talking about the 101st Airborne that you've been saying here. I'll show you the pictures and what I've shown you, but I, I, I lived among these boys. Now, I was right there at the airport, and I was seven years old, and I, I didn't know it at the time. So, and this is my closing picture. What more <laughs> fitting than this? This was in a, in a hold of a ship, a Navy or a merchant marine ship. There are 18 English war war brides here. This woman has twins. And there's one child over here that I can't see her mother. That one right there, I, can, I think her mother's right here. But on this ship, there's 540 war brides. Remember that? Over six? <laughs> here, here's a proof of all of that. So anyhow, they're coming in, and I love it. I had two dear friends that had English brides, by the way. One was before World War II, and one was after World War II. So I have two dear friends, one whose mother was an English war bride, and the other one whose wife was, a, was, a, was an English bride. So that's a show. What time we got? We're, we're still pretty. Got questions, comments, and remarks? And about, as I remember, 300,000 American soldiers went through there, where there were tankers, where there were artillery, 101st Airborne. And, and from there, the boys were going to Europe. But they wanted them to fight there in, in the Tennessee War days because it was land like they would see when they, when they got ashore in Normandy and started fighting their way through Belgium and through France and Germany. The land lay was much like what it would be in Europe. Contrary-wise, they had the Louisiana ball games, which was for a lot of the soldiers that were going to Japan. And that was that was swampy type stuff, and they thought those Louisiana war games would be better. And you're talking about a quarter million boys went through there. You know, it was more than just temporary, it was two or three years. I think the, the 101st was at Camp Breckenridge, maybe for a month, maybe for two months or three. There's no record, there's just no record of it that I have found. Somewhere that record exists, but finding these records can really be tough. You know, Republic Aviation, I, I'd give you $100, I'd give you $500 right now if you can give me the records of, of the actual production techniques out of that Republic Aviation. I know somewhere, the Smithsonian doesn't have them, the Air Museum in Dayton does not have them, so they're somewhere I have an idea of Maxwell Air Force Base. When I was doing earlier research, I found the George Army Airfield records at Maxwell Air Force Base. That's in Montgomery, Alabama. I'm hard. 
And I, I was invited to go down there to look for Camp Breckenridge. Nothing else. And I thought, that's, that's a five, four hundred mile trip, and I just didn't know if it would be worth it or not, so I didn't go. I regret that I didn't. I don't know if I can reconstruct that or not. 